Okay. Continuing on, the the purpose of this uh, second lecture is to talk about uh, elasticity of liquid crystal water. Okay. So what I mean by that is that um, you know in the last class. Uh, I was talking about how the free energy depends on the magnitude of pneumatic order. And so this is what I worked out then, right? And so it depends on the magnitude as represented by the scalar order parameter S. And it doesn't depend on the director, right? Meaning that there's the same free energy for liquid crystals that are oriented this way or that way or whatever direction. Okay, but it does depend on the gradient of the direction of order. That is, if the molecules are oriented this way over here and this way over there, so that the orientation is varying as a function of position, then the variation as a function of position itself has to cost some free energy. Okay. That is called elasticity. That's what this class is about. Okay. So then the question is, um, how does the free energy depend on gradients of the director? And uh, so that's what I'm going to show in the first half. And then in the second half, I'll show some examples of how to use it. Okay. So what we want to do for describing elasticity is to uh, expand the free energy up to quadratic order in derivatives of this director field n of r. Okay, so I'm going to say there's a unit vector n which represents what's the orientation over here, right? And then as we go along, there's an n that's changing as a function of position. So it has first derivatives the free energy will be something that is quadratic in those first derivatives. Okay. As a simple approximation, uh, we can assume that there's the same free energy cost for all different kinds of gradients. Or maybe we want to do better than that. Maybe we want to have the full uh, free energy, called the osain frank free energy, which is different for different types of gradients. Let me show you the simple version first and then the more detailed version. Okay. For the simple version, okay, let's assume there's a free energy density which is the constants, the stuff in terms of the magnitude of pneumatic order, okay, plus uh, the quadratic stuff in the gradients. Okay, so the quadratic stuff can be written in this nice compact tensor notation, which is implicitly summed over the tensor indices i and j. Or if I write that out in um, you know explicitly, that is all the d derivatives of n x with respect to x, and y, and z, and then same for derivatives of n y, and the same for derivatives of n z. Okay, so in our simple approximation, we might assume that these derivatives all have the same elastic constant k. Okay, that is, there's the same coefficient multiplying all of these derivatives squared. Okay, that's called the single Frank constant approximation, or it's called isotropic elasticity. Okay, that the elasticity is the same in all directions. Okay. Oh, and by the way, I'm now going to cross off all these constants, right? The, the, the free energy, the things in the free energy that I cared about yesterday, I don't care about anymore. And so now those, those are constants that I'm going to neglect. And I'm going to look at just these quadratic pieces. Okay. Um, so this is a nice, simple approximation for the, how the free energy might depend on uh, derivatives of the director. 
um, and it has an elastic constant k. So what can we say about this elastic constant, right? Well, for one thing, you know, what are its units, right? Well, this is a free energy density, so it's a free energy per volume on the left side of this equation, okay? On the right side of the equation, the k is multiplying these uh, derivatives of n with respect to position squared, okay? So n is a unit vector, it's dimensionless, the position has dimensions of length, right? So uh, k is taking a 1 over length squared into an energy per length cubed, right? So k has to have dimensions of energy per length. And if I want to estimate how big it is, well, I could think, what's a characteristic energy divided by a characteristic length, right? So the characteristic energy would be something like Boltzmann's constant times the isotropic pneumatic transition temperature, right? That's an estimate of how does the energy, how much does the energy care about orientation, okay? And a characteristic length would be like the spacing between molecules. And so if I put in a transition temperature of about 300 Kelvin, and I put in an intermolecular distance of about a nanometer, um, that makes uh, uh, an elastic constant of something like four piconewtons. Okay, and so that's a, a typical magnitude for the elastic constants in liquid crystals. So, um, you know, here's an approximate view of the elasticity of liquid crystals, right? That whenever you have a change in this unit vector n, you, uh, with respect to position, that costs energy. How much energy? Well, the four piconewtons times the gradient squared. It's not bad. Uh, as, as an uh, approximate way for describing what's going on in a liquid crystal. But sometimes you want to do better, right, for explaining what's happening in an experiment or perhaps for designing some kind of liquid crystal device. Okay, so to do better than this, right, we might say, you know, there can be different kinds of director gradients, right? We might have a director gradient where molecules are going from this orientation here to this orientation here. So they have a gradient like that, okay? Or you might say maybe you're going from this orientation to another orientation like that, okay? These variations might have the same number of degrees per nanometer, but they're not the same as each other. So there's no fundamental symmetry that says that they have to cost the same amount of free energy. And they don't, right? Typically they cost different amounts of free energy. Okay. This, uh, for those of you who are familiar with quantum mechanics, this is analogous to spin-orbit coupling, right? So if you think of the orientation of the, uh, of the director as like a spin and the position as like an orbit, right? This is, this is the equivalent of a spin-orbit coupling in the theory of magnetism. Okay. So you can make an improved theory. This is what was developed uh, many years ago by Hussein and Frank, okay? To classify what are the different kinds of director gradients um, which have different coefficients in front of them, different elastic constants, uh, known as Frank constants, okay? So that's what I'm gonna show you now. Now, um, for any of you who already know something about liquid crystals, right, I can warn you, there's a standard version of how to present this thing, okay, and then there's my version, which is better, okay, ha ha ha, and so um, I'm, I'm going to show you my version, okay, which is a little bit different from what you might be accustomed to, and then uh, I'll show you how it links up with the standard version, how it turns out to be equivalent to the standard version uh, in the end. 
Okay. So, my version. All right. So, um, for my version, let's start by assuming that the director is approximately in the z direction. Okay. So, it's in the z direction plus a little bit of perturbation. Okay. So, it's, it's z, it's going to be in the z direction plus these little corrections, okay? I, I'm not going to limit myself to this, but let's just start this way and then generalize. Okay. In that case, we can make a tensor of, grad of director gradients. That is, the uh, derivative with respect to coordinate i of director component j, okay? So that's a 3 by 3 matrix of all the possible derivatives. It's a 3 by 3 matrix. You might think it has nine components, but in fact, three of the components are zero, right? The derivatives of the z component are zero, right? Because the z component is approximately one, okay? So I want to keep track of the derivatives of the x and y components with respect to x, y, and z. Okay, so that is six components. Okay. Of these six components, let's classify them. Okay, so for those of you who know group theory, I want to break these six components into irreducible representations of the rotation group, the group of rotations about n itself. For those of you who don't know group theory, never mind what I just said, um, I, uh, I want to break this into distinct types of mathematical objects. Okay. So, w one type of mathematical object is this pair of derivatives. Okay. So, this pair of derivatives of nx and ny with respect to z, right? That is special because z is a special direction. z is the average direction of the nomadic order, okay? So I can look at how the orientation depends on z. I can look and say, it can have a variation like this in the x direction, or I can have a variation like that uh, well, it's, it's a variation of the x component as a function of z, or a variation of the y component as a function of z. Okay? This is a special type of variation. Okay? Uh, it is called bend. All right? it, it is a vector in the xy plane, a vector that uh, represents how you have this, this and this component of the variation. And so the pictures of it look like that, right? This is like what I was trying to do with my hands, all right? So this is one type of variation with two components, okay? These two components have to have the same elastic coefficient, right? Because you can get from, from this to that just by rotating about the director. Okay, so this is one type of director gradient with two components, all right? It accounts for two of the six components of my tensor. That means there's four to go, okay? So now let's try to analyze the other four. Okay, the other four make a two by two tensor like this in the xy plane. What can I say about this tensor? Well, for one thing, I can break it into an anti-symmetric and a symmetric part, as you can with any tensor, okay? So here, and, uh, symmetric means symmetric about the main diagonal of the tensor, okay? So I can break it into a part that is the same if you flip around the main diagonal, or a part that changes sign when you flip uh, on the main diagonal, okay? So this part that changes sign, this is a special thing all by itself. It is a scalar, 
or more precisely, a pseudoscalar, right? It is the derivative of ny with respect to x uh, minus the derivative of nx with respect to y, okay? So this is a variation which looks like that in the picture, or to do it with my hands, it looks like, like this, okay? So the director is changing, uh, you know, the, the y component is changing as a function of x, like that. The x component is changing as a function of y, like that, okay? And so this is a kind of distortion which is called twist, okay? For those of you with a background in liquid crystals, it's actually called double twist, right? Or sometimes called double twist. And um, I'll, I'll talk about that more in another day. Um, okay, so uh, it, is, it is a pseudoscalar. That is, it stays the same under rotation. It looks exactly the same as we rotate coordinates and it changes sign under reflection. So that is uh, a second type of director gradient, which has, it, it's not equivalent to bent, right? There's no reason for it to have the same elastic constant as bent, okay? So it is uh, a second type of director gradient, and it has just one component as a pseudoscalar. Okay. So now we have characterized three of the six components of this tensor. Three to go. Okay. So now we need to look at this symmetric two by two tensor. Okay. That symmetric two by two we can break into um, a trace and a traceless part. Okay. So the trace, that means the sum of the diagonal components. Okay. So there's one part of this tensor, which is the, the trace times the identity in the xy plane, times the factor of a half. Okay. And then there's what's left over. The traceless, trace equals zero part. This trace, this is another special type of director deformation. Okay? It is a director deformation called splay. That is the derivative of nx with respect to x plus the derivative of ny with respect to y. Okay? It is the divergence of the director field. It looks like this in the picture, or with my hands, it looks like, like that, right? It is showing how the molecules are sticking apart on the top and together on the bottom. Okay. Um, that, this is called a splay, or by analogy with double twist, it, you call it double splay, right? Because it's splay going out in the x direction and also in the y direction and also in every direction in the xy plane. Okay, so it also, it's another type of director deformation, different from twist, different from bend, and it has one component. Okay, so so far we've categorized four of the six components of this tensor. Two to go. Okay, you good so far? Okay. Now there's two that's left. Um, and um, what is left looks like this, okay? It is a symmetric traceless tensor in the xy plane. So the plane perpendicular to the average director, okay? This makes a fourth director deformation mode which is, uh, which looks like this, okay? So it is a director deformation mode, and one component looks like 
the x component is going out as a function of x, and the y component is coming in as a function of y. Okay, so that and that. Okay, the other component is the same thing rotated by 45 degrees. So it goes out in this diagonal, in in that diagonal. This is a fourth thing that the director field can do, okay? And um, so for those of you who are familiar with liquid crystal science, this is not talked about so much in liquid crystal science, um, but, but it should be, right? I mean, it's, it's the fourth kind of director deformation mode, um, which uh, has two components, so it accounts for the last two components uh, out of six. Okay, so um, it, it is a tensor kind of mode, meaning that uh, the two components are rotated by 45 degrees from each other, as opposed to the bend vector where the two components are rotated by 90 degrees from each other. Okay. So this component hasn't been talked about so much in the literature. Um, in my own writing about it, I've been kind of inconsistent, and I've given it names like biaxial splay because it does two different things in the xy plane perpendicular to the director, or tetrahedral splay because it kind of looks like a tetrahedron uh, standing on its edge that's embedded in this director field there or there, okay? But I have consistently uh, given it the letter uh, delta, and I usually just call it the delta mode now, okay? This is not something which I personally uh, invented. This um, was actually um, worked out mathematically by these guys, Tom Michon and Gareth Alexander uh, in the UK, not that long ago, so 2016, which is relatively recent in the history of liquid crystals, okay? They derived it for the purpose of topology, and they worked out a general expression like this that doesn't require us to assume the director is mostly along Z. Okay. So they would say for any general director field, uh, you can break this tensor n, uh, this tensor of derivatives of n, into a bend part, uh, a twist part, a splay part, and a delta part, where the bend and twist and splay have these general vector expressions, okay? So splay is the divergence of n, twist is n dot curl n, bend is the negative derivative of n in the n direction, that's a directional derivative, or equally you could write it as n cross curl n, those two things are mathematically equivalent to each other. Uh, and for delta, well, the mathematical expression for delta, well, it's, it's this minus that stuff, right? I mean, you can, you can work it out. It's kind of messy, but it's certainly not the messiest thing I've done in my career. Um, okay, so um, now, now we have classified, right, the, the four types of director gradient modes. And I want to use that classification for the purpose of elasticity, okay? So each of these modes must cost some free energy, right? So the free energy should look like something times splay squared plus something times twist squared plus something times bend squared plus something times delta squared, okay? What does the tensor delta squared mean? It means this thing, right? Delta ij times delta ij summed implicitly over the indices i and j, which is equivalent to saying the trace of the delta matrix squared. 
Okay. Question, please. Yes, yes, please. It is the most general way to write it with um, quadratic powers of first derivatives. Okay. This, so, so I've completely classified the uh, things that are quadratic in first derivatives. Okay. You could still add higher powers of first derivatives. You could still add second derivatives. Right, but but this is th at at this order. This is the most general thing. Question. So how come that the fourth the fourth contribution is not talked about? Let me let me show that to you coming up in the next slide. Okay. So now, I mean, what one thing we could try is to say, you know, how do we compare this with the standard version of the osain frank free energy? And that's related to the question of what should I call these four coefficients because I want to give them names which are backward compatible, right? Which, which are consistent with what people have done for 60 years. Okay. So the, the conventional expression is written like this, okay? It is a coefficient k11 times splay squared plus k22 times twist squared plus k33 times ben squared. And then there's this weird thing, okay? And this weird thing has been in the liquid crystal literature for these 50, 60 years, okay? And it is something which is um, you know, consistent with all the right symmetry considerations, but it looks different from everything else because it's not something squared, right? It's just uh, a divergence of this vector, which looks like a bend plus play. Okay. This last term uh, is called saddle splay in the liquid crystal literature, right? And um, it, uh, it, it has been studied for many years. You know, people sometimes include it in theories, sometimes leave it out of theories, okay? So let's relate this thing to my general expression for the director gradients, right? So I, I have an expression for the director derivatives that is this expression right there. So if I put that into the saddle splay uh, formula, um, what I find is that the saddle splay is equivalent to a half splay squared plus a half twist squared minus the trace of delta squared. Okay. So with that mathematical identity, the conventional form for the free energy density now can be expressed in this way. Okay. So indeed, it is equivalent to something times splay squared plus something times twist squared plus something times bend squared plus something times the trace of delta squared. Okay. And now those coefficients can be interpreted in this way, okay? that the coefficient of the trace of delta squared is the K24, which has long been considered the saddle splay elastic constant. The coefficient of bend squared is the K33, as has been in the liquid crystal literature for many years. And the coefficients of uh, splay squared is K11 minus K24. And for twist squared, it's K22 minus K24. Right? So it works out to be consistent with my argument. Okay. Now, in the literature, the reason why people often neglect K24 is that it is a total divergence. Okay? And people will often make a statement like, the integral of a total divergence over the whole volume of a cell can be um, transformed into a surface integral over surfaces of the cell. Okay. That is mathematically true. Okay. Sometimes people then say, 
Because it is a surface integral, we don't have to think about it anymore. That is not true. Okay, so the first half of the statement is true. The second half is not true. You do have to think about it still in many situations. Sometimes you don't if the surfaces are all constrained by anchoring conditions, but sometimes you do if the surfaces have some sort of freedom at them, or if the system has defects, which can be interpreted as sort of internal surfaces. Okay. And in those situations, I maintain that it's better to keep this K24 stuff as a bulk term. And that is why I prefer to think about four bulk modes rather than three bulk modes of a pneumatic liquid crystal. Um, so this now is my uh, general expression for uh, how director gradients enter into the free energy. Okay. Now, earlier on, I showed you a simple version of the elasticity, right? Where all the types of director gradients have the same coefficient. Okay. So to compare this with that, okay, I could say with the simple version of the theory um, where I have, you know, a single elastic constant K, okay, that can be expanded in terms of splay, twist, bend, and delta um, in this form, okay, where the coefficients now are a fourth K, a fourth K, a half K, and a half K, okay? So these... Um, expressions are consistent if k11 is equal to k22, is equal to k33, is equal to 2k24, right? And those things are all given by a single number k, okay? So that's why um, this uh, version of the theory is called the equal Frank constant approximation. All right, and so this is a you know, good approximate starting point for any kind of theoretical discussion. Um, but if you want to be more precise, you have to take into account that these four coefficients might be different from each other. And those might be four different numbers that need to be experimentally characterized. Um, okay. This is maybe a good breaking point, okay? So let's do our five-minute break now, and after the break, I will come back and show you examples of how this is used. All right? Five minutes, you guys. In other words, this is this is quite different in some. Yeah. You, this is not small in any sense. It's That's no, it is not. It is not small. Right. Um, and um, so the reason people leave it out is not because it's small. Right. It, the reason that people leave it out has to do with this divergence. Okay. okay. And you know, as I um, will talk about not today. I um, there's a difference when you think about splay, whether you think of splay in all directions, like this, versus pizza splay, which is just in a plane. If you think about pizza splay, just in a plane, that's uniform there, then you've got some splay and you've got some delta, mm -hmm. and they combine and the K24s cancel, and K11 by itself is the elastic constant for that. Likewise, with twist, you could have double twist, mm -hmm. going all around, or you could have twist just as a function of one coordinate. Okay. 
that's, that's a call steric of the crystal. Okay? If you have that, then you have this piece and this piece and the K24 is cancelled, and K22 mm -hmm. is the elastic constant for that, okay? So I, I think people over the years have been a little bit sloppy in distinguishing between uh, double splay and pizza splay, right? Or double twist and single twist. Not sloppy mathematically, but sloppy sort of conceptually in yeah. what you call twist. Okay, and I'm trying to sort of clean up that point. Huh, all right. Okay. So, but the big picture seems to be it depends on what experimental situation you're interested in. And stuff yes, okay. it depends on what situation you're interested in. And there are different elastic constants for the double splay versus pizza splay. And you have to know what you care about. Ooh. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. Hi. Oh, so I had a question regarding the same term. So could it be fair to say that uh, in cases where the liquid crystal is confined in a volume with rigid boundaries? If it has boundaries with hard anchoring right. and it has no defects, right. then then you can neglect the K24 step. Right, but what mm -hmm. if we had a boundary that was fluctuating, but it still had strong anchoring on the Better boundary? Um, Better Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm just quickly wondering if the claim is here that neglecting the saddle splay is sort of not okay when there's strong anchoring of liquid crystal on a boundary. Is this that it, that it is okay when there's strong anchoring on the boundary? But if there's any flexibility on the boundary, then you better include it. Or if there are defects as internal surfaces, that you better include it. Right, right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, let's, um, let's continue on, all right? And I, I want to show you um, a couple examples of how this is used. Yeah, okay. So, um, the first example um, is a really classic problem in liquid crystals, theoretically and experimentally, um, which uh, has to do with you know, what happens if you apply symmetry breaking fields to liquid crystals. So that you do something that tends to align the director in different ways in different places. Okay, so that they're fighting against each other. Right. So one kind of symmetry breaking field that you can put on is surface anchoring. Okay, so suppose you make a liquid crystal cell and you treat the surfaces in some way that it forces the molecules to line up in a certain direction on the surfaces. Okay? So, for example, people will rub the surface. This is a classic uh, cell preparation technique in experimental work on liquid crystals. And just by, by rubbing the surfaces, uh, you make microscopic alignment, microscopic grooves in the surface, which make the molecules tend to line up. Okay? So the molecules on the surface might be locked in to a certain direction. Okay. Another thing that you can do is to apply an electric or magnetic field. Okay? And the electric field or the magnetic field will align the director in the interior of the cell, either parallel or perpendicular to the applied field, depending on details about what the molecules are, whether they like to be parallel or perpendicular to a field. Okay. Suppose you um, want to make those things fight against each other. Okay. So here's a geometry, uh, a semi-infinite geometry, right? Meaning that it has one surface that's this plane at x equals zero, and then it goes off to infinity uh, for positive x. Okay. So, semi-infinite, okay. On the plane, x equals zero, okay, somebody has uh, rubbed the surface so that there is strong anchoring in the, whoops, 
uh, there's a typographical error here. This should be Z and that should be Y. Oops, sorry. Um, th somebody's rubbed the surface so that there's, there's strong anchoring in the Z direction right on the surface. And then in the interior, in the bulk of the liquid crystal, there's a magnetic field applied in the Y direction, okay, so that the liquid crystal tends to align with Y, okay? So in between, the liquid crystal has to do something, right? In between, the orientation of the director has to rotate from alignment along Z to alignment along Y. So we could model this by saying the director is going to uh, vary as a function of position. Um, that is, it's going to tip downwards like that. Okay. So um, we could model it as a unit vector, which is um, you know, zero in the x direction and then sine theta and cosine theta in the y and z directions. Okay. Now, um, classically, right, in the sort of traditional description of liquid crystal elasticity, okay, people would look at this variation and say it has zero splay, it has non-zero twist, it has zero bend, right, and so um, classically, people would say this is a deformation that's pure twist, okay? Now, I'm coming along and I say, well, look, we ought to think about this delta mode also, and the delta mode for this deformation is not zero, right? I can explicitly calculate it, and it's this tensor right there, okay? Um, so, you know, how do we reconcile these points of view? Right? Well, the, the deformation in this picture is not the uh, double twist, right? isotropic twist that's the same in all directions about the average director. Rather, it is a deformation that has twist varying in one direction like that, and it's totally uniform in the other directions, right? So you could think of this as single twist as opposed to double twist, okay? In my way of thinking, pure twist is double twist, okay? Single twist is a combination of the um, pure twist and this delta deformation mode. So, we put this into the free energy, okay? So it's zero splay, non-zero twist, zero bend, non-zero delta, okay? We uh, combine these terms, and now, look, conveniently, the K24 pieces cancel, and we get um, an elastic free energy which only uh, involves K22 times the derivative of theta squared, okay? Which is exactly the same as the classical point of view on this subject, okay? So the way I try to express this theory is, is indeed backward compatible, right? It is mathematically equivalent to what has been done for many years in liquid crystal research. Um, okay. So, continuing on, all right, so the free energy has this uh, elastic part, okay? The free energy also has a magnetic part, which expresses how the director uh, tends to be aligned parallel to the magnetic field, okay? Um, so that, I'm not going to derive that from magnetism, but I'll just point out it has to be something proportional to h dot n squared. Why squared, you're thinking? Why not just h dot n? Well, because, as I argued for you yesterday, right, n is equivalent to negative n, 
right, that we have equal populations of molecules pointing along N and along negative N, right? So there can't be anything in the free energy which is just linear in N, but it can be H dot N squared, okay? So that makes an H squared times a sine squared of theta, okay? So the total free energy uh, looks like this, okay? So there's one piece that tends to keep theta constant as much as possible. There's one piece that tends to align theta with the magnetic field. So that means in the 90 degree direction. And then there's a boundary condition, okay? So if we say there's hard anchoring, so the director has to be perfectly parallel to the rubbing direction on the surface, that forces theta to be equal to zero at x equals zero. Is there a question? Yes, what is chi? Chi is a magnetic uh, susceptibility, okay. or whatever it is. It's the, the strength of the interaction with the magnetic field, right? And delta chi means the difference between having the magnetic field uh, parallel to the director versus perpendicular to the director. Thank you. Uh -huh. Great. Another question. another question, please. Oh, yeah. What are L, Say again. What are L, and L, The system size in the y direction and the z direction. Uh, right. So we, we have a system that goes from zero to infinity in x, and then uh, it's uniform as a function of y, and it's uniform as a function of z, right? So it just goes off to infinity or to whatever is some macroscopic size in y and z. So the total free energy is, um, is this integral over x, and then you integrate over y and you integrate over z, but you just multiply by factors of the system size in the y and z directions. Okay, so now we have a variational calculus problem, um, uh, which is, uh, want, you have this free energy, which is a function of a function, right? It is a function of the theta of x function, right? Uh, so that is a variational calculus problem. How do you minimize a function of a function? Okay, so some of you uh, may uh, have seen that in math courses. If you haven't, you can, you can buy my book, which is for sale and find bookstores everywhere, right? Um, or, or uh, which is actually free to download at fine universities everywhere as well. Um, um, uh, hopefully including University of Massachusetts. Um, um, but uh, I'll just tell you, right? So the, the way you do that is you uh, derive what's called the Euler-Lagrange equation, okay? So, uh, you take the functional derivative of free energy with respect to theta of x, um, and uh, that comes out with an expression like this, which is a uh, nonlinear differential equation, um, but actually it does have an exact solution. The exact solution uh, has this mathematical form um, expressed in terms of a parameter uh, uh, xi, which uh, comes out with this expression, okay, and basically it's a ratio of this term, the elastic term, to the magnetic term in this uh, free energy or in this uh, Euler-Lagrange equation, okay? So it is a plot like this, okay? And so it's a plot which shows that at x equals zero, the director is aligned the way it has to be, parallel to the rubbing on the cell. And then as you go into the cell, the director can tip over like this, or it can tip over like that, right? It can e go either way equally, and then once it gets to 90 degrees, pi over two radians, 
it will be aligned with the magnetic field, right? Either positive or negative magnetic field. And that will be the optimum bulk configuration. Okay. So this calculation shows what distance does it take to go from perpendicular to the field to parallel to the field. Okay. That's called the magnetic coherence thing. That's this uh, psi variable. Okay, good so far? Question, please. Oh, this is not a plot of psi. This is a plot of theta, of, of the, the orientation of the director. Uh, no. Theta, it's, so it's, it's, this is a plot, whoops, which represents this uh, uh, cartoon that I've drawn right there. Okay, so that at x equals zero, uh, you have the director along the z-axis, okay? So along the rubbing direction. And then when x goes to infinity, um, theta is 90 degrees, pi over 2 radians, right? So it's rotated by 90 degrees from where it started, okay? And psi is what's the distance does it take to get from this alignment to that alignment? Okay, and so when, when h is zero, then, um, then that distance is infinity, right? When h is zero, the director never rotates to be parallel to the magnetic field, right? When h is small, it takes a really long distance for the director to rotate. When h is really big, then the rotation happens in a short distance. Does that answer your question? Oh, uh, it, oh, if, it, if uh, the 1 over psi in this equation right there? Oh, well, it's an x over psi, right? So x, uh, psi gives the length scale required for this, right? So when x is equal to psi, then, um, then you take the hyperbolic tangent of 1, right? And then... I don't know, but that's a number, like 0.7, okay? And then you take the inverse sine of 0.7, right? And that tells you how much the director has rotated so far. If x is 0, you take the hyperbolic tangent of 0, which is 0, and then the inverse sine of 0, which is 0, and you just get 0. Right. Is it okay? Yeah, yeah. All right. Was there another question here? Yeah. Uh, please. So, uh, in the free energy, there are two components, right? So, uh, one is uh, uh, due to the magnetic field itself, uh, mm -hmm. they are interacting with, uh, with each other. Yes. And the first one, where we have K22, is, is, is it corresponding to this torsional stress or something? Because there is no mechanical twisting here. So, how does uh, that... Uh, Yes, so the director is varying as a function of position, right? So this is one example of this general phenomenon that I was talking about in the first half of the class, right? So the orientation is like this over here, and it's gradually changing to be like that, okay? That costs free energy, okay? That f favors, that the free energy cost favors making it as gradual as possible, right? If I make it as gradual as possible, then it won't cost too much free energy, right? So that component of the free energy favors a big magnetic coherence length, right? On the other hand, that's competing with the magnetic field. The magnetic field favors having the director aligned with the magnetic field everywhere, right up to the surface, okay? So that favors a really small magnetic coherence length, okay? So you have a competition between these two effects. 
and the system has to pick the best compromise. This is the best compromise. Okay, another question back there? Yeah, um, so this is about the h dot n squared term. Uh -huh. um, so it seemed like the reason before that you couldn't have linear terms is because the molecules will align in one direction or the other, and that probability is about 50 50 through the way choose a direction. Mm -hmm. Um, it, it, it can. That's something that I'm going to be interested in in a, a couple of days, okay? Um, or an electric field in that case, okay? But even if that did happen, then the population difference would be proportional to age, and then that population difference would interact with age, and so you'd still get an H squared for the, for the energy, right? because of the population difference times H. Right. Uh-huh. Great. Great questions. Anything else? Uh, please. Um, oh, no? Okay. Let me go on to a... a, a, a no, no, please. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, yes. And, and so in a situation like that, you would say um, that uh, the, the surface has strong anchoring so that the divergence term becomes a constant that drops out of the theory. Okay? And the, um, the remaining deformation is just twist, that's what those guys would say, right? I say it's twist and delta, but they would have just thought about twist. And they would have said that the elastic constant for twist is K22, and so it comes to the same thing. So in your final DK length, you would have had a K22 and not a K22 minus K24 or whatever it was? Correct, right. So, so here, the, in my way of thinking, the K24 is cancel, right? In the other people's way of thinking, the K24s were never there. But it leads to the same thing. Mm -hmm. right. So I would say that, um, you know, his, his, as I was just remarking in, during the break to somebody, um, you know, historically, people have not been careful about distinguishing between double twist and single twist. Right? Just as they've not been careful with distinguishing between double splay, that's the same going all around, versus single splay like a pizza that's uniform in the other direction. Okay? Or when I say not careful, I mean uh, they've been careful mathematically. All the math is correct. But they haven't been careful conceptually in how to talk about these modes. And I'm trying to... Um, um, make uh, uh, explicit this conceptual distinction, right? And in this distinction, right, that double splay costs less free energy than single splay, pizza splay, right? And likewise, double twist costs less free energy than single twist by K24, right? And this is single twist, so it has the higher free energy of K22, not K22 minus K24. All right, all right. So um, let's go on to a variation on this problem, okay, called the Frederick's transition. Okay. In this variation, suppose you have a finite liquid crystal between two surfaces, okay? So you have a, a front surface at x equals zero and uh, a back surface here at x equals d, okay? And both surfaces are treated so that the director has to be aligned along z. Sorry for the typographical error again, okay. Um, uh, okay, and in the interior, there's a magnetic field which uh, favors alignment along y. Okay. Now, what's the liquid crystal going to do in that situation? 
Okay. Well, um, if the magnetic coherence length is something small, then it's like two copies of what I showed you before, right? So that near one surface, you start at zero, and then you go up to pi over two in the interior. Near the other surface, you start at zero, and you go up to pi over two in the interior. In between, it's just pi over two. Okay. But what if the magnetic coherence length is not so small, right? So in that case, there's a surface region over here and a surface region over there, and those two regions start to overlap with each other, okay? So that the orientation never has enough room to get up to pi over two, okay? So in that case, you get a plot like this that looks like a sine wave, right? That goes up somewhat, and then it has to go back down again to get to zero over there, okay? So that looks like this and that. Okay, so it tips over a little bit, and then it comes back. Okay. Um, so you tend to go from this you know, sharper variation to this more smoothed out variation as the magnetic coherence length gets bigger, which means as the magnetic field gets smaller. Okay. Now, what if you continue to make the magnetic field smaller and smaller? Okay. Well, in that case, the magnitude of this variation gets smaller and smaller, okay? When you get the magnetic field down to a certain critical value, the magnitude of this variation just goes to zero, and the liquid crystal is just uniform in the interior, okay? So, that happens at a certain finite magnetic field, or equivalently, it happens when um, the ratio of the cell thickness to this coherence length is equal to a certain critical value, which is pi. Okay. Let me tell you the same story in reverse. Okay, so suppose you start with zero magnetic field. In that case, the inside of the cell is just aligned with the z-direction, okay? If you put on a little bit of a magnetic field, the inside is still aligned with the z-direction, okay? So it stays aligned with the z-direction up until you reach the critical magnetic field. And then when you reach the critical magnetic field, it tips over in the interior. And it could tip over in either the positive direction or the negative direction. That's a spontaneous symmetry breaking as it goes from one direction of tipping to the other. So if you plot theta in the middle of the cell as a function of magnetic field, okay, it's zero, 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 up until you reach the critical magnetic field, okay? And then it has this symmetry breaking transition and it goes up to be either positive or negative. And if you go to larger magnetic fields, then you get larger values of theta in the middle of the cell and in the limit of very large magnetic fields, it approaches pi over two radians, or 90 degrees, okay? So this is called the Frederick's transition. This is a, a classical liquid crystal result. It's like the first thing in the history of liquid crystal physics. And um, it uh, happens at a critical magnetic field which has this expression, okay? And so it's the sort of thing that people can measure in the lab all the time, and it's often a good way of figuring out what is the value of K22. Question? Yeah, so if this was solved numerically, is the transition known analytically to be at pi, or is that just... It is known analytically to be at pi. Right? And you can work that out because 
Um, if you have only a very small distortion like this, so that theta is slightly different from zero, then um, the free, you can linearize the differential equation that sol you're solving, and you can solve it exactly. Right, so it's exactly at pi for that threshold. Question? So d here is the thickness of... Okay. d is the thickness of the cell. Uh -huh. How does that work itself into the free energy expression? The, the, the situation we looked at before didn't it include d? Uh, it's because there are two boundary conditions, right? So you're solving the, the differential equation with two boundary conditions at x equals 0 and x equals d. So previously I had only a boundary at 0 and at infinity. Uh-huh, Becca? Yeah, so it, it looks like the liquid crystal doesn't see the magnetic field until it reaches a certain value. The liquid crystal sees the magnetic field, but it doesn't respond to the magnetic field. Right. Um, so yes, correct. Can you, can you say that this thing happens, can you see the energy and say that there's something like this that happens? What's an analogy? Um, well, um, I'm not sure to answer that, but that, this is a normal thing with spontaneous symmetry breaking, okay? So, you know, a story about spontaneous symmetry breaking, right? So you know there's some classic story of uh, a horse that's between two piles of hay, right? And the horse can't decide whether to eat the hay over there or the hay over there because it's exactly symmetrical, right? So the horse starves to death. Right? Um, real horses aren't like that, right? But people are sometimes like that if they're trying to choose a restaurant, right? And they can't decide this restaurant or that restaurant, right? But, you know, the, the, the analogy, right, would be that, you know, if the horse is a little bit hungry, then the horse is paralyzed. It can't decide which way to go, right? But as the hunger increases and increases, right, and you reach a critical level of hunger, then the horse will randomly choose to eat this hay or that hay, right? And it's like that with lots of transitions, right? That with a magnet, as you reduce the temperature, right, the magnet will spontaneously align this way or that way, right? And that's how it is with the field here. Uh, question, please. Uh -huh. Can you look at the, something like the second variation of energy and will it tell you that at a certain point you're going from having one solution to two possible solutions for each? Yes, that would be a good mathematical analysis of this problem. Huh? Yes, absolutely. Uh -huh. Another question somewhere? Please. Um, here we are assuming the boundary conditions that at uh, x equals to 0 and x equals to d. Mm -hmm. uh, we are keeping the angles uh, like they are aligning along, along the z-axis, right? Yes. How do we like uh, ensure that, so do we have a system, because in practically you told that we initially rub them so that they are along one direction. Mm -hmm. But once we do that, they are not constrained anymore not to move. And we apply external magnetic fields. No, no, they're still constrained right at the surface, oh. right? So the surface makes a local effect for the molecules that are right next to the surface. Okay. The magnetic field affects the molecules everywhere on in the inside, but the surface molecules are still stuck, right? And so you still have this alignment right at the surface, and you have a different alignment in the interior. And the competition between those things is what makes the problem interesting. Yeah. Because if we think about it, the uh, surface is more free to move because it's not like, like pulled by both sides. Of yeah, well, um, I mean, there, there can be different kinds of surfaces, right? So, and those have different effects on the liquid crystal, right? So some surfaces have a very strong alignment, right? Which we can approximate as an infinitely strong alignment. Okay, some surfaces just make a weak alignment. And so in that situation, um, you know, the, the magnetic field could tip it somewhat. And then that would be, you know, another mathematical problem to calculate how much it gets tipped. 
Um, it's a good problem to solve. I don't have time to do it here. Uh -huh. uh, okay, uh, all excellent questions. Um, there can be variations on this experiment. Okay, so there can be a variation that would have a deformation that's mostly splay or mostly bend, right? And these are ways that people can figure out K11 and K33. Uh, how am I doing on time, Schwung? Uh, seven minutes. Please. Seven minutes. Uh, okay, maybe I'll do the, the second story just briefly then. Okay. So uh, another situation where this elasticity becomes important. Okay. Um, a, a hybrid aligned pneumatic liquid crystal. Okay. So suppose you make a film of liquid crystal between two isotropic media, okay? For example, water and air, okay? So suppose you've got, you know, water down on the bottom and then oh, a few microns of liquid crystal and then air on the top, okay? So the, you want to know what's the liquid crystal going to do in between the water and the air, okay? So you need to know what do water and air do to liquid crystal, right, at the boundary, to know what's, what's the boundary condition, okay? So that's been um, worked out by many people over many years, okay? So um, let's say for water, there is uh, what's called homeotropic anchoring, that is perpendicular anchoring. The director is locked in to be perpendicular to the surface, okay? So if the surface between water and liquid crystal is in the xy plane, then the director has to be in the z direction everywhere on the water surface, okay? With the air, there is a different kind of anchoring condition called degenerate planar, okay? That means that the um, director has to be in the plane of the interface, but it can be any direction in the plane of the interface, okay? So the interface, again, is in the xy plane, and so the director on the top can be in the x direction or the y direction or anything in between. Okay. So what's going to happen in between those surfaces? Okay. You might say, well, the director can start off at the bottom in the z direction, and when you go to the top, it'll tip over. Okay. So maybe you think the director is going to just uniformly tip over like that, right? or it might uniformly tip over like that, right? Those things would be degenerate, okay? So we could put in, there's a director which is uh, z times this cosine plus uh, a c times this sine, right? Where c is a vector in the xy plane, okay? So that would make a picture kind of like what I've drawn in the left illustration. Here, okay, so this is showing the director that uh, starts off uh, in Z and it tips over in, X, in Y like that, okay? Um, so, is that true, right? We can ask, you know, in the lowest energy state, is this C going to be uniform or not uniform? Okay, so is it going to be like this, or like this, everywhere, or will it be in some places like this, and then in some places like that, and in some places like that, right? Varying with this extra deformation uh, as a function of x and y, okay? So to figure that out, we can take this assumption for the director and plug it into my equations for splay, twist, bend, and delta, and plug that into the equation for the free energy. Okay. And so that makes this three-dimensional free energy at any position x, y, z. Okay. Then I'm going to integrate over the thickness of the film. 
that is from the bottom to the top, okay, integral over d. So that makes an effective two-dimensional free energy as a function of x and y, okay? So this is a kind of dimensional reduction, right? So go from the 3D interior to an effective 2D free energy in terms of C, okay? So I've done all that calculation and it works out like this, okay? So to understand this uh, expression, okay, let's look at the constant term here, okay? So suppose C is uniform everywhere. In that situation, the, that looks just like, like this kind of deformation, okay? Uh, in, in, everywhere in X and Y, all right? Um, that has a lot of free energy in it, right? That is preloaded with free energy because the director is forced to have this gradient forced by the boundary conditions. Okay. Now, if C is not uniform, then there can be these extra terms involving derivatives of C, okay? And then you could say, if C is allowed to vary, does that make the free energy go up or go down? Okay. Surprisingly, it can actually make the free energy go down. Okay. That is, you can have a reduced free energy for the non-uniform system compared to the uniformly deformed system. The coefficient, uh, and, and the, the term that does that is this linear term, right? The quadratic terms only make the free energy go up, but the linear term can make the free energy go up or down, okay? This linear term works out to be proportional to this coefficient of k11 minus 2k24, okay? And so, it, um, it depends on the relative values for the splay mode versus the delta mode. Okay. Look at these pictures, right? In this picture, you can see that there's a variation of the director on the top. There is a, pos a, a negative uh, uh, divergence of C on the top, okay? Um, a term like this, a variation like this, is favorable if k11 is less than 2k24, right? Or the way I should have written that, really, is if k11 minus k24 is less than k24, right? Or, that is, if the play elastic constant is less than the delta elastic constant, okay? That works because this mode has a lot of splay in it. If you look up in this little region where my pointer is, you can see splay. You can see this double splay, right, where the director is sticking out like that, okay? And so the liquid crystal says, here, the delta, this, this double splay, it, it costs some free energy, but not so much, right? That this is a relatively low energy mode compared to the other kinds of deformation. And so the liquid crystal has a tendency to do this kind of thing. By contrast, if the splay elastic constant is high, then you tend to get the opposite sort of effect. You tend to get this positive divergence of the C vector. And indeed, you can see in this picture, right, here is the delta mode concentrated in this region, right? This is a region where the director is sticking out in one direction and in in the orthogonal direction. Okay, and so in this region, um, there is more of this delta deformation 
and that is favorable. So you can get either way, okay? This uniform state is only the free energy minimum in the special case where the elastic constants are exactly equal to each other. That generally doesn't happen, right? That would be a weird coincidence for that to be exactly equal, okay? And so in most cases, you have either this favorable or that favorable, so that this hybrid aligned film will have variations as a function of x and y. And you could see that by shining light through the water, through the liquid crystal, up to a sensor up here. If you shine monochromatic light with just a single color, then you'll get nice patterns of light and dark as a function of x and y. If you shine white light up from the bottom to the top, then the intensity will vary and it'll vary in ways that depend on the color of the light and on the wavelength of the light. So you will get beautiful colorful pictures instead. Um, here are some examples of the pictures that uh, can be seen. These are all uh, coming from um, my colleague, uh, Oleg Lavrentovich at Kent State. Um, he has studied this problem for a lot of the early part of his career and um, so has uh, wonderful examples like this. So these are all modulations which are driven by the difference between the elastic constants. The difference means that the liquid crystal needs to distort in